It's the weekly show with David J. Maloney. This week, David talks to forensic pathologist and medical examiner, Dr. Adele Shaker. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome to everyone at home, and I would normally say our studio audience to the weekly show. I am your host, David J. Maloney. I say normally because we are still taping the show from our home. I can't wait to get back to doing shows at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino, but unfortunately, until uh, it's safe to do so, we will still be doing them here from home. Uh, So according to a new study, drinking coffee daily lowers your risk of stroke, uh, but drinking Starbucks coffee increases your chances of bankruptcy. Uh, In his upcoming memoir, Willie Nelson uh, reveals how smoking marijuana has affected his life. Uh, For example, he started writing the book in 1946. And NASCAR driver Carl Larson is getting his own reality show. Uh, Yeah, it's called The Amazing Racist. Uh, Belated happy birthday to Al Gore, who just turned 72. Uh, Sadly, he could not enjoy his birthday party uh, because he was so obsessed with how fast his ice cream was melting. Uh, Let's see, Radar Online has recently reported that Kendall Jenner is now dating Phoenix Suns shooting guard Devin Booker. Uh, Kendall's been passed around the NBA so much she's going to get Spalding tattooed on her butt cheek. And a new survey says 47% of teens can now text with their eyes closed. Uh, Fortunately, most say this doesn't affect their driving. Uh, And Disneyland has reopened after being closed uh, because of coronavirus, but it is taking extra health care safety measures. Uh, For example, uh, they've closed Snow White's Scary Adventure ride uh, because of Sneezy. And lastly, uh, masks are uh, now mandatory in Ohio. Uh, While other states have uh, flattened the curve, uh, Ohio uh, is round on both ends and high in the middle. Yeah, that's a thinker. So today we have on the show uh, Dr. Adele Shaker. Uh, He's a forensic pathologist uh, and medical examiner. As a medical examiner, Dr. Shaker has been performing autopsies on COVID-19 patients to help the medical and scientific communities, as well as our government, learn more about the virus and learn more about maybe how we might be able to stop it. So if you're concerned about the virus, uh, please stay tuned and keep watching. Uh, There's a lot to learn. Uh, So anyway, we'll be right back after these messages. And we are back. Uh, we are here with Dr. Adele Shaker. Uh, so before we get into the, the virus and current events, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I, I know you've had like a really unique journey in your life spanning continents even, right? That's correct. I got uh, my medical degree from overseas and uh, I have also a law degree, but I'm practicing as a med- uh, medical doctor here in America. And when I came to the States, I have to repeat everything from the scratch. You're going through a series of examinations, step one, two, three, board examinations, and to repeat your residency and the fellowships, which I did. Um, so I was reviewing your biography before this interview and found out that you're actually fluent in three languages, right? Including uh, Kiswahili, right? So what... What brought you to learning all those different languages, and especially that that famous East African language? That's correct. I have been practicing as a physician in Kenya. That's why I have to be fluent in Kiswahili, even to uh, testify in the court, law courts Mm -hmm. in Kiswahili sometimes. That's why. Now, you've got certifications in forensic pathology and anatomic pathology. What For our viewers, what's the difference between the two? Yes. Um... Forensic pathology is a subspecialty of anatomic pathology that contains or um, surgical pathology, uh, neuropathology, pediatric pathology, cytology, and other branches. So basically, forensic is subspecialty of anatomic pathology. So at first, you have to be board certified 
and anatomic, then you sit for the uh, forensic board to be a board certified forensic pathologist. So you've been performing as part of your job, you've been performing, I mean, you've always performed autopsies, but now with it being 2020 uh, and the year that none of us was really prepared for, uh, your skills are obviously highly valued when something like COVID-19 comes along. Um, what does your job look like now on a day-to-day basis? I do autopsies, as you said, and I've been doing that for the last uh, three decades on a national and international level in Africa and then in America here. And that's my experience that spans over three decades. So uh, basically I do here uh, regular uh, cases like natural causes and unnatural causes like um, suicide, homicide, accidental. Mm -hmm. And from day to to day, there are different cases. But now the coronavirus is on uh, the horizon. So we see that on daily basis. And so governments and hospitals, I I presume, are who hire you to examine those who've died from COVID-19, correct? Correct. And some private cases, family-wise. Um, Now, there's been so much information and misinformation on social media, but from someone like yourself that's on the front lines, what are you seeing in these uh, reports that you're making? I mean, uh, everybody knows the virus is serious, but but how? How, how, Can you put it into a context of how serious it is from your perspective? Yes, correct. Uh, At the beginning, like three months ago, it was um, all what we see is SARS. SARS, which is an abbreviation of severe acute respiratory syndrome that can affect the respiratory center or respiratory tract. And we see that in the pulmonary effect. But now it shifts to another clinical picture that can complicate the whole clinical picture of COVID-19 because we see now clotting inside organs, which we don't see that before. Like we see blood clots in the pulmonary artery in kidneys, in some organs like pancreas, which we don't see that on the usual natural cases because of the disturbance between the clotting mechanism and the bleeding mechanism inside the body. And does the virus affect uh, the human being in that aspect now? So when somebody talks about a virus and tries to compare it to the flu or something like that, it's vastly different from that because it does things to organs that, that, that no other virus you've seen does, correct? Exactly. In addition to its effect like uh, flu virus, but it affects other organs. Correct. So, so you, I mean, we, we see these counts of how many new cases there are, and then we see counts of how much hospitalizations there are, and then we see counts of death counts. But one of the things that, that people I don't think are talking enough about are the impacts on vital organs, the, the impacts to the, the lungs, the impacts to the brain, the impacts to the, the, um, um, the heart. Um, what can you tell us about, about what you're seeing in these autopsies of how invasive this thing is? As I already mentioned, it does not restrict the pathology to the pulmonary tract or the respiratory tract, but it can affect the heart, as you said, and the blood clots in the, the coronary arteries or the brain, cerebrovascular uh, accident, and into the kidney, into the pancreas. Even I have seen DVT cases. It affects the venous system. So I have seen a couple of cases by blood clotting. And it affects high-risk group. What I mean by high-risk group, people who have previous chronic condition for the heart, like congestive heart failure or hypertension for uh, diabetes mellitus, especially type 2, more than type 1. And it can affect also people who are immunocompromised. They have low immunity or chronic kidney disease. So, so for example, the concerns you might have in those patients are, are what, stroke? pulmonary embolism, are you finding those things in in the the bodies you're doing autopsies on? That's exactly what you said, correct. Um, What is probably the most surprising thing that that you've encountered in doing these autopsies on these COVID patients? Um, The morbidly obese 
patients are more reliable, high risk group. So I've seen above the index, body mass index of 35, uh, those are v vulnerable to the effect of the virus more than anybody else. Is that because of a high blood pressure or diabetes or, uh, I mean, because when you say somebody that's, that's basically larger has more, more risk, is that because they happen to have, they're more prone to diabetes or more prone to higher blood pressure combination? Exactly. In addition to the obesity itself, which is a high risk factor. So, so being heavy or overweight to begin with puts you in a higher risk group for morbidity from, for if you contract the virus. That's exactly correct. Oh, wow. Um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to a commercial break for, uh, for a couple minutes, and then we're going to come back and talk more with Dr. Shaker about uh, his autopsies and uh, the coronavirus. We'll be right back. And we are back uh, with Dr. Uh, Adele Shaker. Um, Dr. Shaker, have have there been any breakthroughs uh, in the science so far that might that you think might help uh, lead to some better outcomes with this? I hope that they will reach, <clears throat> excuse me, a vaccine mm -hmm. soon because this will save the human beings. That is the hope. Now I understand that that you have. I mean. You're in communication regularly with other countries. I know one day we were talking on the phone about something and, and uh, you had to put me in hold because you were speaking with somebody, uh, I guess, uh, the government in, in Italy, correct? Correct. With some colleagues in Italy, uh, personal communication. So, because they have been hit very heavily with cases a couple of months ago so during are, the first wave. Are you guys... Are, 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 the, are the medical examiners in different countries comparing notes? Uh, we try to do that on a nationwide level and globally as much as we can. Now, um, what are others within your scientific community concerned or not concerned with about this virus? I mean, is there is there a hot button? Exactly, because that virus really can affect anybody of any age. Like I've seen cases, uh, young infants, that means under the age of one year, and up to the age of 89. So it does not discriminate on basis of age. And that's sad. Have you seen any maybe, um, I know we talked about uh, obese and, and you know, let's define obese. What, what do you define as obese? Is, is, it, a, is it a percentage of, uh, I mean, is it a certain weight? Is it a certain weight to height? Yes, exactly. What we call it body mass index above the index of 330. This is considered obesity. Above the index of 40, this is morbid obesity. Between 30 and 40, you can say mild, moderate obesity. Now, is there a consensus among doctors and uh, uh, about what we should or shouldn't be doing to, to fight this, or is it still is there just still too much to learn about it? I think. Personally, I stick to the mask, uh, and I know that it's a moot point. Now, people are supporting masks. Some others are saying they, ha they are valueless, but I personally use masks, different types. And during the procedure, I use um, N95 most of the time. Now, the, uh, from what I understand, you know, the biggest thing about the mask is, is, is if a doctor is working on a patient and they have the mask, then of course, if they cough or sneeze or something, it filters out a lot of the percentage of what would be coming, that they'd be exhaling or what would be coming from their nose or mouth, right? Exactly. Um, and so, but, and then the, it filters only so much if you're wearing it coming from somebody else. You're actually doing, I mean, you're doing autopsy. So a lot of these, these, um, uh, the people, everybody that you, every patient of yours is already deceased, correct? Exactly, but still, the virus does not die with the person. So I did COVID-19, or I used to do COVID-19 of the deceased. Sometimes they are uh, tested negative in the hospital, and they come back positive in post-mortem test, and vice versa. Sometimes they tell them in the hospital, he's COVID-19 positive. And when I tested them, it comes back negative. 
So still the virus does not die with the person. So how long can it stay? We are still uh, collaborating among each other uh, nationwide on, and globally to reach how long that virus can um, live on a dead body. Now, uh, in, in speaking with you previously um, uh, in, in one of our unrelated conversations, um, I remember you saying something about you having one person who, for whatever reason, had, had been there for five weeks and you tested them and they still tested positive after five weeks? He was decomposed, but uh, uh, nobody knows exactly the time elapsed between death and the autopsy. It was uh, more than 10 days. So he tested positive. That means virus can still live in a dead body. So you're saying he was decomposed, maggots, you name it, and he still tested positive? Yes. Wow. Um, so what do you make of the CDC changing their guidelines on, on masks and surface contamination? I know we, we brought up the mask a, a few minutes ago, and you, you said even when working, and I know that you, when you work with a dead body, you're dealing with fluids and things. So obviously I understand that. What do you make of the CDC changing their guidelines on masks and surface contamination amongst other things? Is that because they're learning as we go along like everybody else is? It's evolving process, but at the moment, the best practice is social distancing and mm -hmm. mask is the best practice, to be honest. Got it. Um, so as, um, as you look out on the world, are there some governments that you feel have done better, uh, uh, a better job of guiding their people through this crisis than others? I think here in America, we're doing a great job. Okay. Because of collaboration between infectious disease, uh, medical examiner, emergency medicine, it's uh, teamwork. It's not a one-man show. The, um, now, if, if we want to contain, right now we're having some explosive numbers in certain states, not so much in others, but more so in some states. If we want to try to contain the spread of this thing, what do you think we should be doing now? Uh, I think this is a uh, policy which... I'm not a policy maker, but I, um, I think sticking to the guidelines, which is, uh, as I said, washing your hand, social distancing, and using a mask is the best policy at the moment. Now, um, there was a lot at the beginning where, and I'll, and I'll be frank, I'm, I'm a germaphobe, and so, so I go above and beyond. Like if a package shows up, it gets sprayed, it sits, it... It has to sit for a certain number of days. I'll leave it in the sun if I can, and I won't open it for a while. And then even when I do open it, I'll wipe it down, and I might wipe it down again. Um, so is, has there anything been learned about that? I mean, should we still be washing our grocery bags and taking our clothes off at the door to decontaminate uh, like so many of us did in the beginning? How, how, have we learned more about that aspect of it? I think this is the best policy. I mean, if you don't have an access to alcohol, uh, to sanitize, mm -hmm. you can wash your hands and stick to the rules and regulation, which we, on daily basis, we practice, correct? Um, is, there, is, is there any particular story of, as far as, you know, the thing is, I, I, let me back up for a second. You know, as a medical examiner, you're essentially a, a private coroner, correct? Correct. So you get to learn things that other people don't get to learn, and then you get to share them with the medical community in ways that they don't that they that they don't get to learn in as much in active time, right? So, right. what do you think are the most crucial things you've been able to share with the medical community to to help in this in this current situation? I mean, stay active at the same time because um, to be confined inside indoors, you have to be active. Uh, hydration. And um, I mean, using protective um, equipment when you are interacting with others is the best policy to avoid uh, contracting COVID-19. So being out and about is fine, but masks, very important. Social distancing, very important. Um, exactly. Uh, and if you are in one of those high risk groups, uh, obese, um, uh, diabetes, um, high blood pressure, um, those are all things that are probably signs to say you're probably better off staying inside, yeah? Correct. A high-risk group, high-risk factors, correct. Wow. 
Wow. Well, I, I I really appreciate you being on the show because, you know, the thing is, is right now with so much on social media, there's it's become political when it should really just be about health. And yeah. I think that having you on the show is helpful because a lot of people get to, to see somebody who's really, really not just on the front lines, but seeing it, you know, seeing the patients after they've passed, which is a, a harsh reality. Yes, but I give them a voice. All my patients. I give them a voice, and that's my job, to give them a voice. They speak to me. They speak to me through the lab work I do, the histology uh, and microscopic examination, toxicology, uh, fluid examination. They speak to me by doing x-ray. It's like I deal with them like normal patients, but they don't talk, so they talk to me through the lab work. And and, and that's just, I, I you know, it's just so very important because um how do i put it? It, it it it's it's almost like it's so horrible that the way people are dying from this but at least this way they haven't died completely in vain in that what you're learning from them will help hopefully save other people of course they help the living to avoid uh, the same destiny wow Thank you so much for being with us, uh, uh, Dr. Shaker. Uh, I, I appreciate it. Um, um, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Adele Shaker. And Thank we'll you right so much, David, for having me in your show. God bless. Thank you. We'll be right back. So that is our show for tonight. Thank you so much to Dr. Adele Shaker for all that very important information. Hey, G-Man, take us home, buddy. <laughs>